All right, so Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. <clears throat> it's been uh, interesting getting back to the beginnings of things. And as God reminds us of, of how it all began and who it was all about and, and some of his purposes and plans and where he began things. Because uh, oftentimes we kind of get just off track and we forget. We make our own way. It just seems to be this thing that we do, whether it's the, the Jewish rabbis as they started writing the Talmud or their different interpretations, as they pretty soon they just got way off track. Or us in our life, if we don't stay plugged in, connected, walking with the Lord, we just kind of wind up wandering off track. So it's good to come back to the beginning where so many things started and God began to teach us on so many areas of life. So we finished up last week with the, the completed work that God spread out the heavens and He's still stretching out the heavens. And uh, we saw that it is at the perfect rate to where it doesn't collapse on itself but is continually expanding. He stretches out the heavens like a curtain. And he decorated it with innumerable stars. Billions upon billions, then times billions more. And he hung the earth out there on nothing, as said in Job. He put in place all the natural laws, such as gravity, etc. However, we also saw that he did it in six days. And to do so, you know, there's often this argument or this statement of a young earth versus old earth, but I think that oftentimes leads us to a... a kind of a, a skew point of view. I think it would be much better to look at it through the lens of he created it mature. Just as he created Adam, a full-grown man. As we'll see that he creates Eve, a, a full-grown woman. He didn't have to wait for her to grow up. She already was mature. Just as I believe also if you would have took a core sample of a tree, you would have found tree rings. Because oftentimes they, it's stated that you would have known that the universe is very old because of how far light has traveled from distant stars. But, see, we're, we're measuring it from a wrong point of view. If you would have looked at Adam on his first day, you would have thought he was quite old. Or at least not a day old. So God created the universe also, ready to function, ready to roll. We had light in place. Things were already everything that man needed to be able to observe the stars and to live his life. And so we come into chapter 2. And we're going to talk for a little bit on the seventh day. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done and rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. So here we have the completion of God's creation, that since this point there has not been a creation of new species or new material things. Everything that had been created was finished at that point. We've seen things go extinct, or we... Um, but we don't see new life forms or new things being created. God had finished it. And he didn't cease, he didn't stop this work because he was tired. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 28 says that God never grows weak or weary. Because he possesses all power, it was not a rest as in tired but the word would perhaps better be understood as he ceased. He finished and he stopped the work. So you'll notice here, oftentimes we associate the seventh day with the Sabbath. But here God does not call it the Sabbath. That's not what it originally was. It was the seventh day. It wasn't called the Sabbath until several thousand years later when God first calls it the Sabbath in Exodus, where he takes a, a group of his people that had become slaves 
and he commands them to stop at least one day a week. You know, they don't overgather the manna, don't go out there, to just stop. A bunch of stiff-necked, overworking, workaholic slaves that God said, you will stop and worship me at least once a week. I, uh, I often think about this sometimes with some Romanian friends that I, that I had who, who fled out of communism in the 80s and came into the United States and, and really began to uh, flourish, especially in the 90s, uh, because they said, you know, you mean I can actually work and make as much money as I want? And so they just they worked all the time because they had grown up in communism, they had grown up in a system where this is what you were going to make no matter what you did. And then they came out into this new, new place in, in America and they found that they could work as hard and as long as they wanted and they could make as much as they wanted and they became a little overindulgent in it for at least for a while. But even when it came to the collecting of manna with the children of Israel, God said, no, you're, you're not going to do that on the Sabbath day. You're going to stop. You can gather twice as much on, on Friday, but you're not going to go out and do it on Saturday. This day... There's something special about the day. First off, we see that God blessed it and he sanctified it. There in verse 3, that when he ceased from his works, he blessed this day and sanctified it. So God, after creating this thing that he specifically calls very good, or you could translate exceedingly good, he stops and says, man... This is awesome. Because we find out later in scriptures, he created these things for his pleasure because he wanted to. He, he enjoyed it. He loves his creation. He's blessed by it. It's beautiful. God loves making beautiful things. And he loves making other things into beautiful things. So he stops on this day, this be- beautiful creation. And he says, now this day, the seventh day, when I stopped my creative works... And he looks across what he's done and says, man, this is exceedingly good. And I'm going to bless this day. And I'm going to set it apart as something special. So he blesses it, sanctifies it. So how did we, how do we wind up with all these different thoughts on the Sabbath? Where the Sabbath actually becomes, instead of something that was blessed, and amazing on the creation where it becomes these lists of do's and don'ts. How do we turn the rest, the rest of God, R-E-S-T, or the, the blessings of God to where eventually sometimes they become work. They become do's and don'ts. I have to please God through this. First off, we find that God gives the Sabbath or turns uh, and brings the seventh day into the Sabbath with the Jews with, through Moses and makes them set apart a day, a day in which they wouldn't do anything. But I want to look just a little bit more at the seventh day, this day that God had ceased and blessed. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. See, because there was something that God began to work Something that God began to teach His people and continues to teach His people through this seventh day, this resting that God did. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, He says, So let no one judge you in food or drink regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are the shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. So God begins to work in this seventh day and talks about this rest. This rest for the people of God. And see, we ran with the Jews after the Sabbath or even people today are still chasing around the shadow and are missing the substance. They're seeing kind of the image of what God did. They're seeing something over there and they're chasing it, but they never quite seem to grab a hold of the substance. What do you mean, James? Turn with me also to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. I'll begin in verse 8. So Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 8. 
the Lord says, For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not have afterwards spoken of another day. So if you back up in the context, he, he talks about Moses who had given them a day, but yet they didn't find rest in the day. And now they were going to go into the country, the promised land, but the rest, that which God had promised, wasn't there either. So it wasn't in a day. It wasn't in a special land. Verse 9, there, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also seek, ceased from his works as God did from his. And just another verse from earlier in verse 3 of that same chapter. He says, for, for we who have believed do enter that rest as he has said. I have sworn in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Speaking of people who didn't try to enter it by faith, didn't go to the substance which is Christ to enter that rest. See, God began to work in this, this idea of a rest back in the seventh day. And the word there in, in Hebrews for that rest that remains for the people of God is, is actually sorry, in the Greek there, in the book of Hebrews, is a Hebrew word for Sabbath. There remains a Sabbath for the people of God. The shadow was a day. The shadow was the rest that Josh was going to bring. But the substance was of Christ. And we who believe, we who are in Christ, have access to that rest, have that rest. See, the writer of Hebrews could have used a Greek word for, or the Greek equivalent for Sabbath or for rest, but he put it in there so that there would be no mistake. It's not about the fourth commandment. It's not about stopping on that day and keeping the law. Because as we saw on Sunday in Romans, that Paul specifically linked the Ten Commandments to the law, which Jesus Christ fulfilled. So if you're going back to that old contract, if you're going back to that old day, you missed, you missed the point. You're running around after shadows and you're missing the substance. If you're trying to find that rest or that, that peace with God of ceasing from your works to please Him or to obtain righteousness, you've missed it. See, in Romans chapter 14, verse 17, it says the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. It's not rules and regulations, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The substance isn't rules and regulations, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's something that God desires to give to us and to bless us with. And the Lord really blessed me with this, this understanding, this idea, as I was digging into this back in Genesis 2, was here God had just made man on the sixth day, made man and woman, what was the first full day of the experience of man and woman on this, this planet? Let's start off with God goes and he places them in Eden. Eden means pleasure. He takes them and puts them in this beautiful garden and he names it specifically pleasure. And he puts them in there and their first full day is the seventh day. The fellowship with God, the communion with God is on this day. And he said, this day is blessed and it's sanctified and I'm, I'm bringing to this place of joy and pleasure and peace. And it's not about what you eat and what you drink and, and how awesome you are. It's about being with me. Walking with me in the cool in the evening. Having that mind that has stayed on me, walking with me. Having that relationship with with the living God. And it's kind of weird because we don't really think of God in those terms of, of really going to bring me to this place called Eden and it's, it's pleasure and it's not about things that i got to do and i got to work harder. Consider this in Psalm chapter 16, verse 11. It's kind of a ridiculous verse. Psalm chapter 16. Verse 11 it says, You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. 
Jesus said something radical. He said, you know, these rules, this Sabbath, wasn't, man wasn't made for that. But it was made for him. God made this seventh day, this Eden, this walk with him, this, this rest that the people of God are supposed to step into for us. And how often we love to take the New Testament verses and we like to exchange the Old Testament law for the New Testament law because we, for some reason we, we like this idea of, of it depending on us. But God is a God who, who created these things for His pleasure. All things for His pleasure. And He invited mankind in the beginning to partake in that, in His rest, in His pleasure, in His joy, in His righteousness, as, as man walked innocently with Him. So I'd just like you guys to consider that as you step into this week of what, what the Lord did for Adam and Eve, that place that he placed them in, that first day they got to spend together, their life together. Because it's interesting also that the seventh day, he doesn't say evening and morning. And a lot of people like to do a lot of different things with that. But I believe kind of one of the biggest indications is that it doesn't end. That opportunity to enter that rest, as we see, continues on. That Moses didn't give them with the day and Joshua didn't give them with the promised land, but remained for the people of God who could enter it by faith in Jesus Christ. There was no evening and morning because that rest still remains for the children of God, that we can step in that and that we can have that pleasure and fellowship and walking with the Lord. We, uh, how often we get caught up in our busyness. It's said that uh, we're being crucified between two thieves. The regrets of yesterday and the worries of tomorrow. And so we never really enjoy today. We're always trying to live in the two or three days at a time. But God has a rest for you. God has a rest for me. That we can cease from our works as he did his. Now we know from the Gospels that the Lord is still working. Jesus said, I'm working and my Father is working. And we see from Hebrews also as it continues on that this rest, entering in the rest with God, isn't, a stop, isn't ceasing from doing anything or walking with Him or obeying Him. But it's just much more of a state of being. <laughs> just joking around with John right out earlier. I said, you know, when you're reeling in those fish, some big fish out on the ocean, you're working, but I highly doubt you consider that work. That's maybe not a great example, but there is a, a, a walk and a labor for the Lord that's, that's not by the sweat of the brow. It's not a result of the curse, but it's life and blessing to where we can enjoy just fellowshipping with Him. One old brother would have might even said, practicing the presence of God, walking with Him. couple just simple little jokes. Someone asked their corporate wellness off, officer, can you teach me yoga? And he said, well, how flexible are you? They said, well, I think I can make Tuesdays work. <laughs> Sometimes we'll get in the attitude, if every day is a gift, then you'd like to maybe exchange Monday for another Saturday. And sometimes the only way to keep the dream alive is to hit the snooze button. But after that, we'll get busy. I think uh, America is probably the capital of the busy world, busy life. Um, just like last week as we had the encouragement to spend that time, that devotion time with the Lord, I think the Lord would reinforce that this week with, I really, I really pray if you haven't that you would enter that rest. The first Adam here got to walk with God, and we now have, through the second Adam, Jesus Christ, an opportunity to have that relationship with the Lord. Verse 4. <clears throat> this is the history of the heavens and the earth, and they were created in the day 
that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Before any plant of the field was in the earth, or before any herb of the field had grown, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. In chapter 1, or in the first seven days of creation, God simply uses a, a kind of a generic term, a title, if you will, God. God created. Elohim. But here, as he's going to get intimate with his boy, intimate with, his, with Adam and Eve, we see kind of more the, the personal relationship, the, the covenant name of God come out. Not just simply title, but the name that he would know, be known by much more in a personal or a, a relational way. I think that's pretty significant that, that God didn't just wind up the clock and let it go but that He is a personal God. That He is one that reaches down into His creation and interacts with them and fellowships them with them and walks with them. And so on as we get more into Genesis, we'll, we'll have His revelation of His personal nature more and more of He's our healer or the Lord that sees. He is personal. And he begins to bring that out in here. So, the Lord had not caused it to rain on the earth. It's kind of an interesting statement. I really don't think that anybody can stand and, and talk on it too authoritatively. We weren't really there. We've just kind of really read all the evidence for the most part there is. It does seem, though, if our understanding is correct, that there was this, this water canopy over the earth that it would have greatly affected the winds. And so if there was an evaporation process, it would have simply rained right back on the water from where it came. It would not have actually rained on land. But the Lord seemed to have watered it with a mist that went up from the ground. And that was the way in this, this paradise of God that he kept things, kept things growing. Verse 7, And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground, and breathed into the nost in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So, God created us in his image. And as far as our framework goes, our skin and our bones and stuff, um, on the day that he created us, he created a, a animals and man, a soulish creature, if you will. And our, our physical makeup is really not much different. We're just a bunch of dirt bags. And that's kind of what Adam's name meant. I mean, kind of red or, or of the earth, dirt. Um, and we find that uh, everything that God composed the human body of is, is exactly that. It's, you can find it in the dirt. And if you took us and broke us down to the aluminum and iron and different things that's in us, we're worth a few bucks, not much, just uh, in the flesh, not, uh, not too impressive. But to be given the ability to choose and to have a will, free will like the Lord, the ability to judge and to think and to, and, uh, to feel, to love, to worship, to fellowship, God has given all these things distinctly to man. But here we find something even more distinct that really, if nothing else convinced you, would, should, that we are we're not something that has evolved or just another animal, but something truly unique. It says that he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And literally, this basically means that the breath that is alive, something that was directly given to us from God, that nothing else in this creation has, the breath of life. In Job chapter 32, verse 8, this breath is translated spirit. And later, Job would go on to, to say that it's by this a man has understanding. 
And as we see later on in this chapter, how Adam and Eve forfeit this communion with God, that spiritually and physically, but first spiritually, man died. We find in the New Testament that after that, the natural man can no longer receive the things of the Spirit. That without this, this life, this spirit, this, we cannot receive the things of God. John chapter 3, Jesus and Nicodemus are chatting it up, and, and he's trying to figure out what in the world Jesus is talking about. And said, so, well, you know, do I got I to be born out of my mom again? What are you talking about? No, Jesus said you need to be born of the Spirit. You must be born again if you want to see the kingdom of God. Then later on in the book of John... Jesus comes up to the, the disciples and he breathes on them. And he says, receive the Spirit. The Spirit of life. In which you can pass, as Jesus said, from death to life. Man has been given something that cannot be earned and cannot be bought. And it separates him above all things more than his ability to stand up straight or to have a bigger brain, but it's something that allows us to be with the living God now and on into eternity. Life, the Spirit, the living breath that He became a living being, made alive. It's awesome. It's awesome. Verse 8. The Lord planted a garden eastward of Eden, and there He put the, the man whom He had formed. And out of the ground the Lord had made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So here we see God planted a garden not just having things kind of just growing over the, the face of the earth, but he made something particular special. And he named it Pleasure or Eden. He made it this beautiful place. And we don't really know where exactly Adam was at. We know that it just wasn't first off in the garden. Whether that was for five seconds or however long, uh, I'm not sure anyone can really say. But he says he, that he put the man whom he had formed there. And it was east of there. And God made it beautiful and put all sorts of plants and trees that just weren't simply met the need, but they were pleasant and they were good. I've often wondered, you know, that is such an interesting thing to me about the Lord that He doesn't simply make food fuel or flowers, something to take up a spot in the field. But God is into things that are good. God loves things that are beautiful. He loves to, to create them. He loves to enjoy them. He loves for you to enjoy them. Because they're good. So is He. Check them out. Enjoy them. But here, I believe we really kind of see bringing out that with this, He also puts a choice, which we'll touch on a little bit later this tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord here highlights both of them. Out of all the multitude of different trees that have grown, He highlights these two. Now, this place that was eastward in Eden, and it would seem probably either eastward from where Moses was writing this or relative to Israel as you kind of go over. And... I don't know how much I buy into, but I'm going to share it anyways because as it gives all these instructions of, of kind of what it was like and where it was like, um, I don't know how much we can really know because of the flood, because of the geographic changes over the millenniums. Um, but it would seem that Moses thought it was eastward, may have been from where they were at. Um, don't, don't really know. But eastward of them, you come over and most archaeologists and anthropologists and many Bible scholars believe that it was in kind of where Mesopotamia was, over by Babylon, Ur, that kind of plain there, just 
just around the Persian Gulf where Eden may have been located. The Babylonians actually had kind of an old myth and old writings that we have. To, they actually described something that was really similar to Eden, that, that uh, that's where man was, was created. Well, they, and they put in their version gods, but that it was protected by a, a spiritual being and that no one could go there anymore. All over, kind of on the same place. Archaeologists and anthropologists believe that um, that is where all races and nations kind of go back to that point, this cradle of human life. There's a massive amount of fruits and vegetables um, that all seem to originate from this, this area over there, kind of east of where they are, were in this, this plain over by Babylon. Almost all of our, our oldest writings and some of our oldest pieces of antiquity are all found from that area. So does that mean that's it? I don't know. I think it's kind of cool. And it seems to line up. So we kind of so we pass it out there, pay your nickel, make your choice. It's interesting, but it's not something to get red-faced and argue about. Well, one thing we can is that there was a garden, and there were trees, and there was a tree of life and a tree of knowledge of, of good and evil. Knowledge there is, is knowledge or perception, skill, discernment of good and evil. Verse 10, Now a river went out from Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first was the Phison. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Havalah. And there <laughs> where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. I'm not sure I've ran into bad gold, but the, land, but the gold there is good. Bedellium and the onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Hedeko, and it is, it is the one which goes toward the east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. So a lot of people also kind of jump on that area over by Babylon because the Tigris and the Euphrates, a couple of rivers that are, that are brought out here, um, the Tigris by a different name, but it was the same river. That, therefore, that's kind of proof that this is where the area was. Again, we don't really know. Again, I largely go back to the flood, which re, really kind of repainted the face of the earth, but... There's a lot of good evidence that suggests that it may have been. And so God gives us a good description of kind of where it is. And uh, it seems that maybe even the Israelites might have had a decent idea. Verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend it and to keep it. The principle of first mention oftentimes... Almost without exception, at least no, no exceptions that I'm aware of, gives us kind of the basis of interpretation for the rest of Scripture. It kind of sets us up to understand um, a particular topic throughout the Bible. So you go back to when it's first mentioned, and you and you go from there. And the Lord here takes the man and he puts him to work to tend and to keep it, to guard and to protect. We oftentimes now in our, our society as, as men are quick to back down from this original assignment, this, this original task that God had given the man to tend and to keep, to guard and to protect, to make sure everything is as good and, and as well. And as we see our country kind of departing from Christianity, from the Word of God, from the Gospel. So we see man departing from his role, where men will no longer rise up, where they just kind of go with the flow, or not standing up for the things of the Lord, not guarding it and keeping it to tend and protect, because this is very much a role that God also gives the overseer or the elder in the church to guard and protect, to tend it and to keep it. 
The Lord has a job for us men. And whether it's your family or your community or something at your work or here in the body of Christ, there is still an area of your life that you are to tend and to keep as the stewardship of God to protect it and to guard it. And if you're not sure what that is, I pray that the Lord would, would reveal that to you. Now the Lord continues on here in verse 16, and He commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So in this place of tending and keeping, in this place where God is fellowshipping with them and they're walking in innocence and blessing, righteousness and joy, pleasure, God tells them that uh, it's all yours, except for that one. Interesting, God knowing that, that Adam would sin in it, that Adam and Eve would do this, He tells them beforehand, when you eat it, you shall surely die. Or basically, dying you shall die. That though Adam did not croak over in that moment, he, he spiritually died in the moment that he ate and that would play out as he slowly physically began to die. Aging is still... Something that, even with the increase of knowledge that we've had, we just don't really understand why this genetic gene that causes us to begin to slowly die kicks in. We really don't understand it. But the Lord said that it would occur when you do that. I also personally believe that this is when the second law of thermodynamics began to really take effect in the creation, which is basically that everything is wearing out. The world's slowing down, the sun's burning out, humanity is getting worse, everything is wearing out. We can see that there was a beginning and a scientific law says that we are wearing, the whole universe is wearing out to an end. That all creation now is groaning being under a curse, waiting for the revelation of the sons of God, waiting for the Lord to come. Because dying, you shall die, Adam, Eve. But God puts this choice with him. And I believe that we see that there really can't be this love relationship. There really can't be this walk with the Lord without choice. This, a love relationship doesn't exist without choice any more than you can love a rock. And God here gives him a choice to not only walk with him, but to choose to love him. See, we don't have like this button that God presses and every time he wants to hear us say that we love him. But it's something that we have to choose to do, to love the Lord our God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength, to love our neighbor as ourself, to have these relationships in our life, there must be a choice. And I believe that the ability to choose and the free will that God gave man in the garden, I don't believe that God ever removed that from this choice, that men and women are still able to respond to the love and the grace of God. The Lord says that He gives everyone a day of visitation, that he will, he will meet everybody at some point in their life and they'll have an opportunity to reach out to His, his grace. But here in this place of blessing, He only has one that He doesn't have to choose. And it's interesting that when Eve is tempted by it, she said, well, it is beautiful and it is good for food. But so is every other tree. God already said that, that you made them all beautiful and, and good for food. Um, I, 
I think also for myself here, and I just want to encourage you guys in this, is godliness with contentment is great gain. Because I find it interesting that the, the tree of the knowledge of, of good and evil was sitting there, and he could reach out to obtain something that he did not have. As he walked in blessing and innocence, joy and peace, that tree was a doorway to get something that he did not have. Because Satan came up and tempted him and said, hey, God's holding you back. We'll get to this later. He knows that when you eat that, you're going to be like him. There's things about this world, there's things going on that you don't know. You're not in the know. You guys just be bopping along. You're missing out. He's holding you back. You could be like him. So this, this choice and this walk that he has, there's a tree over there with the, the knowledge, the ability to know, perceive, the skill, the discernment to know good and evil. But yet Adam was perfect. He didn't lack anything. But the tree, this temptation, this thing that he says, don't do that or you'll die. He doesn't say, I'll kill you. That's not God. He says, you walk off there, you want to break fellowship with me, that's where death is. It's not where I'm going to be out there with my big hammer to whack you. But that's where death is. Here's where life is. And we, oftentimes, will look at out in the world, we get this pressure to conform, or we're walking with the Lord, and we'll get that temptation and say, well, hey, there's something you don't got. Over there, man, it looks good, doesn't it? Yep, yep, mm-hmm. There's something that you could have that you don't have. Oh, yeah. It is pretty. It does look good. It's good for making one wise. That's the temptation went. just want to encourage you guys tonight. There remains a rest for us that we can enter in. And it's not about a day. It's not about a land. It's about Christ. Don't chase after the, the shadows. Let's go for the substance. Because God has this life and this walk for us in, in His rest. This restored relationship through Jesus Christ. And it's good. But there still remains things out there that the enemy is going to dangle in front of us to say, hey, you know, God didn't give you everything. Hey, he's holding a little bit back from you. God says, don't go over there. That's got death written all over it. Stay with me. I want to close with 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. First Timothy 6, 6, which says... Oh, sorry, 6.5. Useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth who suppress that godliness is a means of gain. Oops. From such withdraw yourself. It was verse 6. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. In your walk, in my walk with the Lord as we enter his rest and we're living life with our beautiful bride or our great grandkid or our kids or all of these blessings that God has given us as he puts clothes on our back and food on our table life and breath let go of the regrets of yesterday and the worries of tomorrow or that feeling that God's got that stuff sitting right over there and he's just not giving it to you so you're going to go reach out and take it. But find that rest and that godliness with contentment and just fellowship with the Lord tonight in the morning as you walk out this week. Because man, he's given us access. He's not holding us back. If he's holding us back from something, it's probably because we don't need it. Even if we don't have it, we think as America we're supposed to have it because even, you know, Middle class was built on that. 
Well, I want my kids to have a better life than I did. Well, maybe it's not good for them. Uh, perhaps a generation or two ago, we should have said, hey, that's good enough. We're pretty blessed. I don't know. But I do know that God has a place of peace for you. And he doesn't withhold any good thing and every good and perfect gift in your life is from him. Be content. Live with him and enter his rest. Father, I thank you for this evening. God, I thank you for, Lord, just your heart. That you didn't make man a slave. God, you made him in a loving relationship. Placed him in a garden that you called pleasure. And his first day out of the gate, he gets to spend it on a day that you blessed and sanctified and said, this is my rest. Let's enjoy an amazing creation. God, I pray that uh, we would enter that rest. Lord, not substitute it for a day or a place or a tree or whatever, Lord. But that we would walk in faith and fellowship and communion with the living God, entering that rest, being content trusting that our Heavenly Father has given us everything. And if there's something He's told us not to have, probably a good idea. Stay away from it. God bless our week. Lord, we love you. Amen.